monkeying with physics. As long as human beings have looked up at the night sky, we've wondered what the stars were and what makes them shine. But despite wondering for hundreds of thousands of years, only in the last 80 have we come to understand how and why the stars shine. In 1920, Arthur Eddington speculated that fusion of hydrogen into helium powered the stars. But it wasn't until 1939 that Hans Beth did the math to prove it, earning Beth the 1967 Nobel Prize in Physics. The only chemical elements produced in the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium along with trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. It was believed that stars could account for the production of the 88 other naturally occurring elements. The elements we know and love, which form our bodies and are necessary for our existence. These include carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, iron, and so on. But there was a problem. In 1939, it was discovered that there is no stable element with an atomic mass of 5. This is known as the mass 5 roadblock. Like a staircase missing a step, it prevented heavier elements from being built up adding one hydrogen nucleus at a time. Instead, the process would halt at helium-4, a helium atom with two protons and two neutrons. Perhaps two helium atoms could fuse to make beryllium-8, and thereby jump over the missing fifth step. But this didn't work either. In 1932, John Cockcroft and Ernest Walton found that beryllium-8 is unstable. It lasts for less than a thousandth of a trillionth of a second. Their work won them the 1951 Nobel Prize in Physics for transmuting the elements, realizing the long-held dream of alchemists. There are no stable elements with a mass number of 5 or 8. In the words of William Fowler, the mass gaps at 5 and 8 spelled the doom of gamers' hopes that all nuclear species could be produced in the Big Bang one unit of mass at a time. So yet another step was missing. With no known mechanism to get over the hurdle of the mass 5 and mass 8 roadblocks, there was no explanation for how elements necessary to life came to be. This problem led the cosmologist Fred Hoyle, in 1953, to make what's described as the most outrageous prediction ever made in science. Hoyle's outrageous prediction was the existence of a yet undiscovered excited energy state of the carbon-12 nucleus, which had somehow been missed by all the particle physicists in the world. If this state existed, it would allow the triple alpha process, the simultaneous collision of three helium-4 nuclei to yield carbon-12. If carbon could be made this way, the mass-5 and mass-8 roadblocks could be cleared, and then other heavier elements could be built one hydrogen or helium nucleus at a time. Without this state, carbon would be many millions of times rarer, and we wouldn't be here. So, Hoyle reasoned, this state of carbon must exist. In 1953, Hoyle traveled from Cambridge, England to visit William Fowler's nuclear physics lab at Caltech. Hoyle asked that Fowler's lab do the experiments to check for this state of the carbon-12 nucleus, which he predicted should be at an energy level of 7.68 million electron volts. Quote, I was very skeptical that this steady-state cosmologist, this theorist, should ask questions about the carbon-12 nucleus, Hoyle just insisted, remember, we didn't know him all that well, here was this funny little man who thought that we should stop all this important work that we were doing otherwise and look for this state, and we kind of gave him the brush off. End quote. William Fowler in Interview, 1973 but Hoyle succeeded in convincing a junior physicist at the lab, Ward Whaling, to check for it. Five months later, Hoyle received word. Whaling confirmed the existence of the excited state of carbon-12, and it was almost exactly where Hoyle predicted, at 7.655 million electron volts. Hoyle's prediction is remarkable because he used astrophysics, the physics of stars, to find unknown properties in nuclear physics, the physics of atoms and their nuclei. Fowler was an instant convert. Quote. So it was really quite a tour de force, 
that a man who walked into the lab predicted the existence of an excited state of a nucleus, and when the appropriate experiment was performed it was found. And no nuclear theorist starting from basic nuclear theory could do that then, nor can they really do it now. So Hoyle's prediction was a very striking one. End quote. William Fowler in Interview, 1973 Fowler took a year off from his post at Caltech to work with Hoyle in Cambridge. Together with two astronomers, Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage they worked out a complete theory of element formation, showing how every element is produced and explaining the relative abundances of the elements as found in nature. Their work was revolutionary, and it made a name for the authors. For this work, Fowler received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1983. Hoyle, however, did not share in the prize, creating controversy. In any event, no one denied the significance of their accomplishment. With their 1957 paper, humanity finally had an understanding of where all the matter, which makes up our world, our food, our shelter, our very bodies came from, the innermost depths of long-dead stars. This is what Carl Sagan meant when he said we are star stuff harvesting starlight. Quote. We are literally the ashes of long dead stars. If you're less romantic, we are the nuclear waste from the fuel that made those stars shine. End quote. Sir Martin Rees in What We Still Don't Know, Why Are We Here, 2004. And so, the world as we know it is owed to the carbon-12 nucleus having this chance property. Like the delicate balance of the density of the universe, the existence of this state hangs in a delicate balance. As it happens, the energy level of this state is at 7.655 mega electron volts. Had the energy level of this state been less than 7.596 mega electron volts or greater than 7.716 mega electron volts, there would be almost no carbon in the universe. The minor miracle of the carbon-12 nucleus having this excited state, and it being in exactly the right range did not go unnoticed. Quote. Some supercalculating intellect must have designed the properties of the carbon atom, otherwise the chance of my finding such an atom through the blind forces of nature would be utterly minuscule, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a superintellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. End quote. Fred Hoyle in the Universe, Past and Present Reflections, 1982.